Uh, welcome to lecture three. This is the lecture where we go hunting for wonder functions. Okay. See, uh, we'll recap first of all. What is a wonder function? What is a weak wonder function? Something you saw in the last class. These guys are all equivalent, which is nice. Right? You don't have to worry about weak or strong. No problem. Uh, and then we'll go look for wonder functions. What is a wonder function? What is an example of a wonder function? Uh, we saw one in the last class, which is multiplying large numbers. Multiplication is a one-way function. In fact, we showed that it's not a it's not a uh, one-way function the way we define it. It's only a weak one-way function. And then we saw how to, you know, so take any weak one-way function, you can amplify it to a one-way function, right? I mean, so if you don't care about, you know, silly things like polynomials and large polynomials, things of that form. But today what we want to see is a, is a nicer construction of one-way function, something that people actually use in practice. And yeah, this will serve us well as we, uh, uh, as we go along in the course. And that's based on number theory, uh, group theory, and that will sort of uh, you know, recap a few basic things from number theory and group theory. Uh, to calibrate myself, OK? Um, how many of you know what a group is in that issue? That's nice. Um, how many of you know the Lagrange theorem? That's nice too. Um, how many of you know a um, elliptic curves? Impressive. Um, so I know who I'm going to call on for questions now, right? Very good. So, so we'll go along, um, and uh, you will help me out. The people who know what uh, what you're <laughs> Uh, what you studied a year ago, as opposed to me. Um, and uh, eventually, we'll hit on a problem called the discrete logarithm problem. And this will be a basis of what we call sort of encryption, you know, uh, you know multi-party computation, <laughs> and, uh, There are other things that will come up. But this is sort of one sort of uh, thing that will you know, stand as a good, good step. Okay. All right, so let's get started. So, one way function, right? Mm. You know, so the, 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 the axiom in this class is, uh, is that uh, you know, everyone, that includes me, that includes you, that includes the adversary, that includes people who sample things, everything is efficient. And for me, that's the axiom, efficient means polynomial time. Efficient means polynomial time, but polynomial time doesn't entirely capture what we can do. Because there are certain things that I can toss coins, right? I can decide quickly in polynomial time while I make a one person error. So I have to let you, I mean, otherwise I'm not capturing nature, right? I have to let you run in polynomial time. I have to let you toss coins. I have to let you be random. So that's the axiom, right? I will allow myself to do that run for longer time to toss coin. I will allow you as an adversary to do, do that too. Right. Not important. You know, we'll sort of deal with things like, you know, well I well, who am I, right? I mean I, you know, I'm a two-way machine, right? I run in a fixed for longer time. Okay, so I run in n squared. Maybe n cubed. Okay. But in cryptography, we want to protect against adversaries that run in any polynomial. The polynomial time is efficient, but what polynomial time is efficient? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Huh? The adversary could run in n to the 5 time, n to the 6 time, a million times n to the 6 time, that's all fine. Huh? So the, the critical thing in cryptography is that I have to design a one-way function or an encryption scheme, which I have to write it down, you know, and I have to send it to NIST, and they think for five years, and they make it the standard. And that has to run in a fixed polynomial time. Yes, that has to run in time, linear time, otherwise they'll kick me out. Okay. But that has to be secure, whatever secure means, against any polynomial time. That's the that's a, this, is, this is the gap, right? I mean, you know, if you're not living in the 1950s where you know people came and said, you know, here, here's a here's an encryption scheme. Right? Then other people came and said, look, that's not. It's not a good encryption scheme because here's an attack. Okay. Then these other people said, "Well, look, you know, uh, here's a way to fix this attack." 
Because other people said, look, here is an attack against the fix. And here is the fix against the attack against the fix. OK, that's not the way we work. We want to design one encryption scheme, which is secure against class of adversaries. And that's, the, that's the key. That's, that's, what, that's what makes cryptography hard and okay? So the way we capture all these things is by the notion of polynomial time and uh, the notion of negligible uh, functions. So let me sort of redefine three things for you that we saw in the last two classes. Uh, negligible. So function. Okay, so I should ask you to define it for me, right? You were Zoom in the last two classes. So, can anyone define it? <coughs> Poor aging cryptographer with uh, now very good memory. Oh, a function that's for sufficiently large value of the argument is less than one over any polynomial. One over any polynomial. Okay, so a function. So let me kind of make it precise. So that one is negligible. Sufficiently large n is written this way, such that for every n bigger than n zero, f of n is bigger than one zero. So, so, what is the point of a negligible function? You know, an event that happens with this probability, with probability equal to negligible, so the probability of an event happening is a function of uh, n as n grows, stuff happens. Um, and let's say the probability is a negligible function as n goes. What is your chance of observing it? You know, you, you run this event, you're, you're a polynomial time algorithm, you can say, press a button, this event either happens or not happens. Press another button, event happens or not happens. How many buttons can you press? Polynomial, because you are my axiom says that everyone is polynomial, including you. If you run for polynomial time, restart this event. If it happens to make it to the property, you never see. That's it. Okay. Everyone with me? Soto? <coughs> you should get coffee. Uh, I want to make sure that I don't fall asleep in this. <coughs> All right, so one-way functions. That's the second object. So there are many ways of defining one with functions. Fortunately, it all turns out to be equivalent. Right? Here is one formulation, and we'll keep seeing so, you know, different slightly different formulations. Where that mention uses, and we have a surname for the name Josh. Okay. Um, so Josh here. Um, Josh Alden. Whoa. Oh. Getting it.
just in case you didn't see who that was about, that was your TA, John. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> Alright, what were we talking about? Quantum functions. <laughs> so, uh, quantum functions. So, your functions, uh, the takes means to space. And, uh, you know, that takes means to strings. And why is it called, when is it called one way? Uh, when no adversary, here's an adversary that will always appear in our games, the probability that A gets f of x, where x is uh, chosen at random, 0, 1 to the end, A gets f of x, and he outputs what? This is a success event of the adversary. So when, when does that adversary succeed? Because x is a negligible function. It exists in negligible. Function. I'll call this <coughs> NEGL for a negligible function. That's what Should it be any inverse? Beautiful. I'm sure that uh, we're all awake. So here is a one-way function that satisfies my property, okay? One-way function outputs 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, okay? If I give the adversary f of x, Poor guy, what's the chance that he's going to come up with x? Nothing. I gave him 0, 0, 0, 0. That's not fair. So, this is, give me any inverse. It's in f inverse of f. That's how I'll denote it. But you know what it means, right? So, this is a set. f of x is a number. f inverse of x is a set of inverses. Give me one from the set. Okay, so, that's a one function. What's a weak one-way function? So, because this is a weak one-way function, so this is a strong one-way function, or just a one-way function. What is a weak one-way function? So it's the same function, you know, and, you know, strings to strings. And uh, the guarantee is that uh, there is a polynomial, 1 over q, that for every adversary, probability, the same story, right, the same as here, is at most 1 minus 1 over f. Right, so here we are asking the adversary to not be able to invert except with 1 over poly probability. I'm asking a lot for the adversary. Like if, he, if he inverts with probability 1 over n to the 100, he wins, because that's not negative. Here, I'm, all I'm asking is, I'm asking the adversary to do a lot more, right? I'm asking, say, well, you invert with probability 1 and n to the 100, you don't win, right? Because you're supposed to invert with probability very close to 1. That's when I define you win. This is a statement that says an adversary does not win. An adversary does not win if his probability of inversion is at most 1 minus 1. It's, very, it's a very... Uh, Mild. It's, it's, a, it's a very strong condition on the adversary, and it's a very mild condition on us, on the designers of the one function. So then you say, well, you know, these guys turn out. Well, clearly this is obvious. This turns out to be true. Okay, so we didn't prove it. We stated the construction. We didn't prove it. And I would recommend that you go back and read the proof and do the post uh, we have until writing the uh, poster. So this is one example of a reduction, and you know we, the reason we are not doing it is because we'll get to interesting reductions pretty quickly in writing the next class. All right. So so this is the base. Now let's see where do I get one-way functions from? Concrete one-way functions. And to tell you the truth. <coughs> These are never going to be one-way functions. They're going to be candidate one-way functions. In other words, I'll come up with a, with, a, with a function, and I'll say, look, you know, I tried to break it. Well, not just me. You know, mathematicians tried to break it for 30 years. They couldn't. Here it is. It's a candidate one-way function. 
if I say a one-way function, that actually means a candidate one-way function. And we can't do any better, because if I end up coming up with a function and proving unconditionally that it is a one-way function, in the sense there are no adversaries in English, I would have won a million dollars in particular. Yeah, I would have proved in particular that P is different from NP. That's an easier problem than uh, proving an unconditional, showing an unconditional one-way function. And uh, I, I, I don't fancy myself doing it. Okay, so that's why we have candidate functions. <coughs> okay, so, so we want to come up with candidates. And this will be this will come from group theory and number theory. So I have the unenviable task of uh, introducing groups to uh, an audience, half of which probably knows what groups are more than me, so I'll try. Uh, what is a group? I don't know. What is a group? That's a group, right? What is a group? A group is just a set with where you can take two numbers from the set and you can do stuff to it. You can do a binary operation. This is the set Z8, which is numbers 0, 1, and up to 7. And the operation is just addition mod 8. You take two numbers, add mod 8. So when, when is it a group? When, well, the set is closed into the operation. You take two numbers, add them, it falls into the set. Well, adding doesn't make it into the set, but adding and mod 8 does make it. Uh, identity. There is a special guy that if you add to any guy, you get the same guy. Okay. That's identity. Zero is an identity. You need inverses. So any number should have a friend who, if you add to it, it book vanishes. It becomes the identity. That exists. And four, associativity. Which is a strange thing to think of it. I mean, if you're a five-year-old, I'm not sure how I would explain why associated is important to my father. Um, Associatively just says, you know, addition you can do in any order you want. Not any order. You can do it. Five plus three plus six could be five plus three plus six, or five plus three plus six. Both work. And uh, this is a group. A commutative group is where the order really doesn't matter. 3 plus 4 equals 4 plus 3, as, as happens here. Okay. Yeah, everyone swarming up. Okay. So <coughs> group G is a set together with uh, an operation. Here this is an example. <coughs> All right. <coughs> the order of a group is the number of elements in the group, the size of the group. It's just a fancy way of saying the size of the group. Now I'll write the uh, sort of group operation as multiplication because that's what will end up happening eventually, although here is addition, right? It doesn't really matter. Right? Um, so so what the, the next fact is, uh, is Lagrange theorem, which says for every element in the group, if you add it to itself, the size of the group many times, uh, you get one. So you take one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, eight times, you get eight, which is zero. A to the order of the group is the identity. One is the identity. Yeah, easy, easy, easy checks. Okay, now I would define, quite confusingly I must say, the order of an element, which is different from the order of a group. Okay, so what is an order of an element? What is the order of an element in the group? This is the minimum i such that a to the i equals 1. So 
minimum number of times you need to add an element to itself. A to the zero is by definition one. Right? The minimum number of non-zero times you need to add A to itself to get one. Such a number exists because we are talking about finite groups, right? It always exists for any number. Um, and uh, Lagrange also tells us, really what he tells us, is uh, order of A divides the size of the group. So the order of any element, well, certainly if you go the size of the group, it, it's less than the size of the group, right? Because we know that, uh, if you go that if you go that far, you already hit one. But in general, the order of an element will divide the size. to discrete logarithms pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, a generator of a group is an element, is an element, is an element A of maximal order. Right. So this is a guy that is, uh, it is, uh, uh, he's a free mind, okay? So you keep adding himself to himself, and he says, I, I don't want to go to one, okay? So I keep wandering around. Of course, he can't wander around arbitrarily. Eventually, he has to reach one when he hits the size of the group, and that is the first time he hits that one. So in particular, if you take a generator of this form, you take, you add it to itself, you add it to itself, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, <coughs> eventually you will generate the whole group. You will hit all the elements of by definition. That's why it's a generator. That's a generator. Now discrete logarithms. So A is an element in the group, G is a generator of the group. that A equals G to the R. So this is, what does it say? I give you a generator. I know that if you keep walking, adding to itself, you will hit all the elements of the group. Now I give you another element of the group. A is an element. The discrete logarithm is a number of times you need to add G to itself to hit A. So this number is not uniquely defined per se, because if you hit A in five steps and the order of the group is eight, you will hit A again in 13 steps, in 21 steps, and so on. But if you look at the number between one and the size of the group, this is a uniquely defined number. That's called the order. Um, let's call the discrete logarithm of uh, A to this. Okay. Is that clear what it is? Yes? Is the one there like the identity <coughs> not like the exact well, uh, The one? A, A to the G equals one in the Lagrange. A to the G equals 1 is the identity. Okay. It's, so the, it's the additive, uh, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the group identity. Right? It's the additive of multiplicative. We talked about the addition, which is zero, with its zero. Right? It's a bit confusing. So I, you know, I want to talk about both additive and multiplicative groups. I don't want to change like 0 to a 1. It's very confusing. So when I say 1, you know, when there is no cause for confusion, it will be the group identity. Good question. Thanks. All right, so now we come to the discrete logarithm problem, informally stated at this point. <coughs> so given a generator in some form, G a generator of uh, the group, A a random element in the group, find the discrete log of A to the base. 
simply stated. Right? Again, I give you a generator of the group, I give you an element of the group, and that element happens to be a random element, uniformly random element for the group. And you have to tell me how many times do you need to add G to itself to hit A. And that's your Okay, so that's, that's informally. Why informally? Because I haven't fixed the group. I haven't told you what the group is. And, you know, how am I supposed to build a one-way function out of this if I don't know what, you know, what, what's the group I'm talking about? Okay, so that's the next item in the agenda. Like, you know, this sounds like a nice problem. Right? Sounds like a nice problem. What we want to do is we want to find group G Right, if you think about one-way functions, it's not that it had it's not just a hard problem, right? It is an easy problem together with a hard problem. Okay. It's easy to go forward, hard to go backwards. So hardness is not good enough by itself. So what I want is a group where the group operation is easy, easy meaning polynomial time. Polynomial time meaning polynomial in the length of the elements, obviously. And discrete log is hard. Hard meaning no polynomial time algorithm can uh, solve. That's what I want. What, what, what is such a group? <coughs> hey, so we saw one group. <laughs> okay. Z and okay. together with the addition operation. That, uh, that's the only group we saw so far. Then uh, you say, well, discrete logarithm on this group sounds pretty good, right? But let's think about it for a moment. What is discrete logarithm on this group? Well, first of all, is this group cyclic? Yes. Why? It has a generator of one. One. Beautiful. One. One plus one is two. Plus one is three. Quickly it generates. Not quickly. Pretty slowly it generates the entire. That's very good. Uh, huh. uh, we, know we like prime numbers, so let's say well, n could be prime. But p sounds like a good letter for prime. Okay. So prime numbers. So one is a generator for any group. For any group. How about other numbers? So it's two a generator for that group. For Z8? No. No. Yeah, it's half the group, right? For things, we convert it straight. Four, also not a generator. Five, on the other hand, is a generator. We can do to see what it is. In general, any number that is <coughs> relatively prime to the order of the group is a generator of that group. Yeah, okay, so that's good. So the good thing about ZP, right, is that every number less than P. Uh, except for zero, it is relatively prime to P. So you have tons of generators. It's a big party of generators. One, two, three, four, up to P minus one are all generators in school. So I said, you know what? I give you a random generator. Although I didn't require G to be random here. You know, let's say, why not? Randomness is always good. So I give you a G. I give you A. Random element also in the group. But I want to find the discrete log g of a. Is it hard? No. Can it, anyone? Division. It's division. Good. So you want to find an x such that a times uh, g times a, g times x equals a over the group, so that's <coughs> one group. How would you do it? You would compute G inverse mod P, and that would do that. So this is not a good guy, uh, but that leads us to a potentially good group. Okay, so this is not going to work. All right. So what else is there? Now that we are, now that we are on it. Now that we're on it, 
let's try to see which pro which problems are easy on numbers. And so I want to build up my arsenal for this. Which problems are easy on numbers? I don't know. Adding numbers is pretty easy. Pretty easy as a full on time. Multiplying numbers is easy. Computing inverses, so this is all mod, uh, mod some n. <coughs> Computing inverses, well, apparently it's easy, that's what uh, I've been told. Give me a, well, how do you do it? What is the algorithm? What is an algorithm? Computer inverses. Okay, let me give you a <coughs> this is no mod here, yeah? GCD of two numbers. This is the mother of all algorithms. Okay. Euclid told us two thousand years ago. Jesus Christ. Uh -oh. two thousand years. Um, uh, told us this is easy. Follow me. Also told us computing versus modern is easy. This is the extended Euclidean algorithm. So extended Euclid says, well, whenever A has an inverse, this is an algorithm that will find the inverse. Right, so when does A have an inverse? When A is relatively prime to L. So this exists if A is relatively prime to L. And when that happens, Euclid will also tell you two numbers, x and y, such that this is true. Yes, the extended Euclid algorithm. So therefore, a times x is 1 mod uh, n, taking both sides mod n. And x is actually the inverse of it. It's, it's, it's free, free me. OK? So that's, that's, that's the inverse mod n. And that's your attack there. Yes? So, uh, Have, uh, a to the power of the size of the group is 1. So a to the power of the size of the group minus 1 is the inverse. Beautiful. Except, what is the size of the group? It should be uh, all, in the, all in the function of n. And if a is a prime, it's n minus 1. Good. n is a prime, it's n minus 1. What if n is not a prime? What if n is a product of two primes? Product of my of my number then is the uh, p minus one times q minus one. Good. So if I give you n, can you compute it? What you can? What well, can you compute? I don't know. Are you following me on time? You are following me on time. Okay. So uh, so I give you an I pick a number p and q in my head because yeah. we are jumping ahead, but we'll come back. Ah. Have to find the so you have 15 minutes to come up with a polynomial time algorithm <laughs> to compute uh, five minutes. I know that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, nothing is impossible. Like, what do you mean impossible? We believe it's hard. Oh, who's we? I mean, I believe it's hard. Because, so because uh, if I, in fact, if I do come up with, with an algorithm in 15 minutes, I can write a paper. I think it's better than so the best algorithm in the world now. Anyway, so you, you're not easily fooled. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's do that. Okay. All right. You, you, know, you know what it is, yes? I mean, you can, uh, so the, 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 the upshot of this is that if I give you n and a, uh, what's your name again? Uh, my name? Yes. Mao um, Xiao. Chinese name. Good. Let me try. <laughs> Mao Xiao? Yeah. <laughs> I'm honorary uh, Chinese now. <laughs> um, good, so, so, so this is a, not a good strategy in general, right? You know, um, because computing A inverse, what would you do? You compute uh, A to the power of 5n minus 1. 5n is some, not something I told you yet. Uh, okay, I'll tell you. Um, right? But you, know, you don't know how to compute 5n. So, uh, okay, okay. But, so, so that's the beauty in some sense, right? So that strategy works for any group. Take any group, take the order of 
the group, yes? Raise the number to the power of the order minus one. That's by definition the inverse of the element. Why? Because when you multiply the two guys, you get a to the order, and then that's one, right? That's a great strategy for any group, if you can compute the order of the group. And we'll get there. We haven't quite, uh, quite got into it. We're jumping ahead, of course. That strategy is hard here for this group. So this group is not the same as the additive group. It's a multiplicative group, and that strategy is hard. But Euclid nevertheless solves it in a different way. See, it's a, that's magical. All right, so let's keep going linearly. Um, so a to the b mod n. So the numbers a and b, a to the b mod n. What about this? Uh, <clears throat> if you write b in binary, you can keep squaring things, and it's a lot easier. Keep squaring things is one way to one one thing you have to do. Uh, that's not enough. Uh, you have to take every intermediate result mod n. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is an obvious thing, but uh, one is two. Yeah. So all these things are easy, easy in polynomial time. Certain things are sort of linear time, others are quadratic. One of these is cubic. It's the best we know how to do it. This one, the polynomial. All right, so 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 now let's actually get to the get to the get to the point. <coughs> but let me define the group Z and star. Okay. So this is the set of numbers. Um, set of numbers between 1 and uh, n that are allowed to be prime to uh, track. And this, together with the multiplication operation, forms a group. It's something to check. Okay. So wh why am I restricting to GCD xn equals 1? Because I want multiplicative inverses. Right? Otherwise, you know, a number that is not relatively fine to n will not have a multiplicative inverse. Therefore, it won't be a group. Is that right? so what is the order of this guy? And that's what, uh, that's what we heard, right? The order of uh, the n star is a number called the Euler torsion function. Um, so, order of this group, for example, is what? Uh, Z8. Z8, uh, sorry. Z8 star, let's say. So in general, if z p star, the order of z p star is p minus one. If p is prime, if p is prime. Okay. What about the order of z p squared star? So suppose you have z nine star, right? P times p minus one, because there are stuff, there are you know annoying numbers in the middle that are p multiples of p. So, so this is p times uh, p minus 1. In general, cp to the k is p to the k minus 1 times p minus 1. Again, if p is prime. Yes? This is counting. Inclusion, exclusion, if you will. Just have to get pedantic about it. <coughs> and what about... And This guy is beautiful because the Euler torsion function, so this is, this is pi of p, right? This is pi of p to the k. Pi of uh, p to the k times q to the l is pi of p to the k times pi of q to the l. In other words, it's a multiplicative function if p and q are primes. So now I have told you enough information to compute phi of any number. Uh, not efficiently, right? But if you can factor the number, you can use this formula to compute it. So in particular, uh, a case that will be important for us is when n is a product of two primes, when it is 2 minus 1 times uh, 
All right, so um, for today's class, I'm only going to talk about um, numbers n that are prime. So then zp star the matter, is 1, 2 up to p minus 1, and you know, particularly every number has an inverse, very nice. Right. You know the order of the group, that's a good thing to have, p minus 1. All right, so now, did we define cyclic groups? Uh, I suppose we didn't. Um, group is cyclic. If not only is the, uh, if, if, uh, if it has a jump. find the discrete logarithm problem if I don't have a generator. Okay. So it's kind of nice to have a generator. Uh, this I want to keep around, so let me keep it around. Uh, all right. All right. ZP star is our is our king today. Good thing is that it's ZP. Does anyone know know a proof of uh, of this fact? It isn't trivial, completely trivial. By which I mean uh, fifth grade. I'm not sure, but uh, does anyone know the proof of this? Uh, Okay, so what I think it's sort of beside the point in a sense. I should really ask you to look it up. Um, <coughs> but let's prove it. Okay. Might be surprised. Because okay. I'm going to claim that this guy is cyclic. If you don't believe me, then we lost the point. I will reserve the right to make claims without proofs, but uh, this one I'm okay. So p minus 1, right? So zp minus zp star, the order of every element is divides the order of the group, which is p minus 1, right? So all the divisors of uh, uh, p minus 1 are the possible orders of elements. Right? So let's, uh, let's say d is the divisor. D is possible. Okay. So all the devices. Okay. So just write them down. I give each of them a bucket. Okay. Device one gets a bucket. Device two gets a bucket. So what does it mean for A to have order D? It means A to the D equals uh, one. The identity one mod uh, one. D. <coughs> yes. So let's give each of them a bucket. One gets a bucket. One is an order, but the only one that lives in this bucket is one. P one, P two, and so on and so forth until potentially the size of G, the P minus one. So. A bucket could be empty. It could be that there are no elements of a certain order. In fact, we are trying to prove that, that that's not the case when the bucket is p minus 1. Yes. Bucket could be empty or not empty. Let's say it's not empty. Okay. Then I claim, you know, there cannot be a party with one person. If there's one person in the party, there are many people in the party. Okay. So suppose there is a guy in the bucket, A, in the bucket D. So what does that mean? A to the D equals 1. That means that there are many elements of order D. There's one element, there are many elements. Why is that the case? What are these many elements? I don't know, I try writing them down. They well, one, which is not. A, which is by definition, by assumption. A squared also has order D. Why? Because A to the two, to the D. 
is a to the d to the 2, which is small. Okay. So there's order at most d. Okay. By the time you hit d, you're, you're good. A cube, same story. Up to the a to the d minus 1. a to the d is 1, so you know, keep cycling around. Right. So these, these, are, these are all guys that have order at most d. Okay. But I'm asking for the yeah, elements with order d, not at most d. That's what goes into the bucket. So some of these guys, for example, let's say d minus 1 is, uh, is even. Right? d minus 1 is even. Then this guy has not order not d, but rather d minus 1 over 2. Yes? So some of these guys could have smaller order. Which of these guys have order exactly d? Relatively prime. A to the i, where i is relatively prime to d. So of which there are how many? Phi of d. Right? So if there's one guy in the bucket, there are phi of d of them, at least. <coughs> the beautiful thing is that the sum over all divisors of n, phi of d equals n itself. I'm making this without proof. Uh, again, you can prove it by content. And therefore, what does it mean? It means that all these buckets should, if one of these buckets is empty, things don't add up. So all buckets should have elements. In fact, there should be uh, an element uh, in the p minus 1 bucket. There's one element in the p minus 1 bucket. There are five p minus 1 elements in the p minus 1. Many generators. So, so not only is there, so the proof that uh, ZP star is cyclic shows you not only that there is a generator, that there are many generators. How many? Five p minus 1. Yes? So you said that the sum of the five minus A uh, good question. Good point. <coughs> good point. How do I prove that there aren't two? Uh, if you consider like x to the d minus one as a polynomial, Beautiful. it can only have d roots. Yeah. Or yeah. And these are the d roots. I told you, you know more number theory than I do. There you go. So, abundance of generators, which is beautiful for us. Abundance, why? Because I, you know, p of p minus 1, again, this is not something I'm going to prove, is large. Is, is of the order of uh, p over polynomial. So, if I pick a random element in the group, the probability that it's a generator is, uh, is pretty large. Yes. Isn't it not true in... Like when you go in x squared equals 1 mod p, you don't only have two of those. Yeah. Yeah. So then it's not bounded by the order of the uh, polynomial. No, it is. It, x squared equals 1, right? I mean, uh, so it yeah, has. Yeah, x squared equals 1. Don't you have like all the quadratic residues? So you have more than two? No, no, no. No, what do you mean? x squared equals 1 mod oh, p. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So if p is prime, again, so, uh, you know, uh, with the statement you're making, x squared equals 1 mod p has uh, two roots. Over the complex number, over the complex numbers, there's two roots of mod p, but mod uh, nine, well, never mind mod nine, mod what uh, fifteen? Okay, it has four roots. Strange stuff happens when you don't talk about uh, primes, but let's not, let's not get there. Okay, so the equation x to the d equals one mod p has uh, at most p. And, 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 and these are the, 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 the roots, so there cannot be another sort of imposter. <coughs> All right. Okay, so, so that tells us that we are good. We are good with generators. And now I can define the discrete logarithm problem over Zp star, which is given random 
generator G and random A chosen from ZP star find X such that G to the X equals A mod B. That is the discrete logarithm problem. And this I challenge you to solve. This, if you solve, I think you are you're a rich man of all. This is how the street logarithm is. So I haven't, I made a lot of things quite concrete already, but not everything. Right? Not everything. <coughs> not everything. To use these guys in cryptography, I need to find, you know, I need to find groups at this point. In particular, that means I need to find primes. Uh, and they do primes. They do I find primes. Thankfully, they, ha they occur a lot in nature, turns out. The prime number theorem tells us that among the n bit numbers, roughly 1 over n of them is prime. See, you throw a stone, you hit a prime. Lorals. Okay. That's not good enough, right? I have to be able to, you know, so, okay, so I throw a stone with probability 1 over n, I'll hit a prime, but how do I know that I've hit a prime? So I have to be able to test whether a number is prime or not, and that, thankfully, again, is in polynomial time. So that's that's non-trivial. How many of you have seen this in 6046 or maybe like uh, 18 uh, something or the other? So P and T, prime number theorem, says the number of primes, n bit primes, <coughs> divided by number of n bit numbers, roughly one over n. And primality testing, of which there are many algorithms, the most Recent and probably the most famous one is uh, an algorithm of uh, it's called AKS algorithm, Badrawal, Kaila, Senna. Which is the first primality algorithm I saw, believe it or not. Uh, I mean, there are tons of primality testing algorithms, things that you see, six, four, six, in number theory. They're all randomized. This was the first deterministic primality testing algorithm. Okay, so that's, that's, that's check mark. Done. So I can come up with these groups. I can come up with primes, I can come up with random primes. How? I pick a random number of n bits, I test if it's a prime. If it's not a prime, throw it away. Test again. Pick again. How many times do I have to pick? Roughly n times. Probability 1 over n, every time I pick, I hit a So I quickly find the prime. All right. That's not good enough. Generator. I want a generator. But how do I find a generator? For ZP star. Once I pick the prime, I have ZP star, the description of the group, and now I want to find a generator. Okay. <coughs> so thankfully, generators come a plenty. How many generators are there? There are three of three minus one generators. You have to compute yourself, what is P, well, how large is P of P minus 1, order of P of P minus 1, it's pretty large. It's, uh, it's a 1 over polynomial fraction of, uh, of all uh, numbers. Is it multiple. n bits uh, primes over n bits numbers? Because I don't see. Uh, which one is it? Uh, n bit primes, yeah. The number of n bit primes over the number of n bit numbers. The fraction of the probability that I hit it. How do I, so, so given that I have an abundance of generators, what do I need to do? Just pick a random number and see if we stop, right? And what do I do? I mean, I, you know, I, uh, um, probability 1 over polylog P, which is polynomial, 1 over polynomial, input line, you get a generator. But 
I need to test that uh, what I got was a generator to begin. I mean, what's the point of having a number where I don't even know if it's a generator or not? What is the hypothesis? So how do I test if a number is a Given a number, how do I test if it's a generator? I don't know if this is the best way, but you can take like that number to the p minus one over two to the p minus one over any factor, any prime factor p minus one. And if they're all different from um, suppose p minus you knew the factorization of p minus one. P minus one, we know the prime factorization. You take a number g, which you randomly pick, you check that uh, what g to the p minus one is always one. Right? And I want to make sure that no smaller um, power hits a one. And what are the possible <coughs> Orders, these are all the divisors of p minus 1, all the factors of p minus 1, of which there are many, right? I mean, you, there are many. I don't need to check all the factors, that's but I just need to check the maximum factors. In other words, these are, these are very close to p minus 1. These are qi away from p minus 1, one multiplication of qi away from p minus 1. If these guys are not 1, then one can show that G is in fact a generator. It's not very hard. Right, so, so the checking is check that for every I, of which there aren't many, right, how many distinct prime divisors does the number have? At most logarithmic. So you can check. If you know the prime factorization, Never stops, does it? Um, all right. Well, so what we do in practice, and and, and 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 this is an open problem. How do you check whether a number is a generator? If I just give you p and g, without, of course, without knowing the factorization. So okay, that doesn't sound good news <laughs> for me. I want a generator. Where is the generator? What we do in cryptography is we say. You always have a way out. Talk about not arbitrary points, um, something called strong primes, it's really Sophie Germain primes. Okay. So I'm going to talk about prime C, which will perform two times another prime plus one. Okay. How do I come up with these things? I first come up with Q. Okay. It's a prime. Good. I do two times that plus one. Okay. What is the chance that that's a prime? Well, I don't know. It depends on the density of uh, of subdivision of primes, of these of the primes of this form. Um, conjecture to be one over polynomial fraction. Uh, I keep doing it. Okay. So I keep picking q. Check if it's a prime. Do two q plus one. Check if that is a prime. If yes, I say aha, uh -huh, done. Okay, I have a I have a good prime, good for life. Okay. So these are called strong primes. I suppose uh, same primes. Maybe P Q is called this. P is called the stronger safe prime. I think Q is called the Sophie Germain prime. I think, right? <laughs> this person is, by the way, a famous mathematician. Beautiful work. Uh, this is probably the most trivial of uh, you know. Uh, Give a name, right? Uh, <laughs> deep, beautiful work. The good thing about these primes, if you manage to find them, <coughs> is that you can compute, uh, you can test if not, things are generators. Yes, this is pretty trivial. I know the factorization of P minus 1 because I came up with it myself. So it's one way to solve, there's one practical way people solve this problem. There is another 
way to solve it because this you should you should object okay you should you should, you should object why because you know this p is a very special kind of prime okay uh, who says that uh, you know it could be that discrete logarithm is hard on random primes but they happen to be easy on these strong primes okay evidence suggests that that's not the case in the sense we have algorithms which perform in their worst case sense on these primes but who says I say Another way to do this, solve this conundrum of knowing the factors of human response is the following. This you should think about every time you, you hit a barrier, right? <coughs> if someone gave you a P and a G, it seems hard to check that G is a generator of P and stuff. But that's not the game we are playing here, right? That's not the game I'm playing. I am playing the game where I pick P together with together with possibly side information right? that allows me to test for a generator pretty quickly. Okay. You don't give me a prime and say and a generator and say test if this is a generator for Z. I come up with P. So 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 what you can do? It's a, it's a beautiful paper which I think we should post. It's a one-page paper of Adam Kalai um, saying you can generate a random number. Uh, together with its uh, factorization. Right? So, so, see what I'm saying? If, if you generate a random number, and you, you, here's one way to generate a random number together with this factorization. Okay? Generate a random number, try to factor it. <laughs> okay? That doesn't work very well, typically. But you could somehow generate both together. It's a beautiful one. So now I could generate a random number together with this factorization and check that the number plus one is a prime. And that will happen with pretty quick probability by prime number four. And then you're done. Okay. Now you know the number b, which is prime, together with the factorization of p minus one. Now the world is beautiful. No one does this in practice because it's quite inefficient in the sense of a large polynomial time, but you can do it. Okay. Generate random number n together with its factorization check if n plus 1 is prime if yes we're done otherwise we'll be so this is an algorithm of the We are in business finally. You know how to generate primes, you know how to generate generators for CP star. So, therefore, the discrete logarithm problem, which I think I erased, um, is going to find. So, now it's it. Now let's actually start doing cryptography. Okay. So, so, now I want uh, to show you a couple of things in the remaining time. <coughs> One, a, what happens uh, naturally is that the discrete logarithm problem defines a collection of uh, one-way functions. Not a single one-way function, but that's, that's, that's okay. These are all equivalent. So in other words, the discrete logarithm problem defines a collection of families of functions. So F is a is the universal function. Fn is a set of functions that maps to, you know, for each input length, for n bits. And Fn itself, natural numbers, Fn itself is a collection of functions from some domain to some branch. Okay, this is different from the notion of one-way functions you saw before, which is just say strings to strings. It's one function, strings to strings. I'm making life a bit more complicated. It turns out that these two guys are equivalent. You have one, yeah. yeah. This is a syntactic uh, kind of manipulation. Somehow you do it once in your life, and then you say, that's the last time. First and last time I'm going to do it. Okay. All right, so, so again, what it is, is you have a collection of families of functions. This is not a single function. It's a family of functions itself 
together with the domain and range, right, get found with uh, domains and ranges, such that each function in this family maps this domain to this range. Right? Yeah. And typically, it's indexed by some, some, uh, some number. So, so, discrete, so, you know what? Without talking more formalistic things, let me actually tell you what the what a collection of one-way functions is from the discrete algorithm. Okay. So, so here's a collection of one-way functions. Uh, and uh, what do you need from these things? Okay, good. So, so one, you should be able to sample a random function f i in f n in poly, poly n time. What's the point of the family of functions if I can't find a function? Rather, actually, even sample a random function. Two, I should be able to sample a random element in d sub n in poly n time. Right? What is the point of a function if I can't sample an element from the domain? And then, of course, f should be computable in following n time, just without saying. Here's the family functions. <clears throat> ah. Keep having to define things. So what does it mean to invert uh, you know, a function from a family? Well, I pick a random function from a family. I pick a random element from the domain of the function. I give you the function index. I tell you what the function is, because otherwise they're not playing fair game. I tell you what the is a function. Here is uh, the output of the function when I compute on a random input. Now you tell me an inverse. It's a fair game to play, and that's, that's, the, that's what we're doing. <coughs> this is a family where P and G are, where well, P is an n-bit prime. G is a generator of ZP star. The domain is what? The domain is what, actually? Is a, num is a set of exponents, right? It's a set of exponents. The exponent could be 0. Why not? It could be 1, 2, 3, up to p minus 1. Well, p minus 1 doesn't make any sense because uh, any number to the p minus 1 is 1. So that's 0. Right? So the domain here, domain is the numbers 0, 1, up to p minus 2. In other words, it has size p minus 1, p minus 1 numbers. What is the range? The range is zp star, which has p minus 1 numbers. This is the size of the domain. This is the size of the yes? The, the exponent group is actually z sub p minus 1, the additive group. Yes. So I multiply two numbers, g to the x and g to the y. What happens to x and y? They add up. Right? They add up mod what? Mod the order of the group, which is p minus 1. Yes. You say d n here is d. A. No, I, I mean, ah, yes, uh, it's still a bit different from what I said. There's not one domain for n, there's one domain for function. Yeah. It's even a bit more. pains to say what? To say that, well, first of all, this is a family of one-way functions. And not only are they a family of one-way functions, they have the following nice property. The size of the domain and the size of the range are the same. And this function is a one-to-one one-way one that, that, that word, yes. <laughs> uh, right? It's a bijection. 
between uh, the domain and the range. Right? Every element in the range has an inverse and a unique inverse. Good, so this is a family of uh, one-way permutations. Very good, very good. So we, we, have, we have stuff to play with now, which makes me very happy. Um, what do I want to, okay, good. So I want to tell you one thing. This is an algorithm. Okay. This is an algorithm. How do you find discrete algorithms? It's an unfair question to ask. I'm not asking you to do it in following your time. I'm asking you what is the best way you can think of to come up with the discrete algorithm, to solve the discrete algorithm problem. <coughs> hey, let me start off, okay? Enumerate <laughs> over. Uh, <coughs> One, two, three. I have to go until p minus one. You know, fine. So this is order of p time algorithm, uh, which is not very good. The enumeration is a great strategy to solve any problem, <laughs> but, but uh, great in some definition. But can you think of a better way? A slightly better. Way. Okay. By the way, p over two might work randomly. Yeah. Here's a way to solve. Here's a way to solve a lot of problems, actually. It turns out, okay, with, with nice structure. Uh, so, so, so you say a is uh, g to the x. This is what I want to find. Right. Well, x is a number from zero to p minus uh, two, okay, one to p minus one. Of course, I can write x in or in in base square root of p. Okay, square root of p is not an integer, but square root. A number close to square root. So write x in base alpha. Alpha is roughly square root. Okay. So what did I do? I didn't do anything because I don't know x. So I don't know how to write x in the base, whatever you want. Now the following magical thing happens. I say a times g to the minus x2. <coughs> equals g to the alpha to the power x1. <coughs> Fantastic. Again, I didn't do anything because I don't know all these things. I'm doing these things in my head. As a mental okay, let's move things up. Now I claim I have an algorithm that runs in time square root p instead of p. How? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build one table. Yes? which contains all numbers of the form a times g to the minus x2. But x2 ranges from what? It ranges from 1 to square root p. Right? x2 is the, is the least significant digit base p. And now I'm going to write another table, which is of the form g to the alpha, alpha I know, so this is a number, g to the alpha is a number h, to the power x1. Enumerate over all x1. This for all x2. Right? So this is the... So what is the size of these tables? Square root p. Uh, what is the time required to complete these tables? Square root p times polylog p. So square root p. Yeah. Now what do I know? I know that there is there is a right x1 comma x2 pair. In fact, there's a unique x1 comma x2 pair. And then I hit the, the, the right x1 x2 pair is where this entry, a times g to the minus the right x2 pair, is the same as g to the alpha to the right x1 number. So I just need to find a common element in these two tables. How do I do it? Well, here's one stupid way to do it. Just check every pair. Okay? But, no. Come on. Yeah. Uh, here's another way to do it. Sort these numbers. And then go through them. That takes linear in the table size time, which is square root one. That is the square root p algorithm is variously called uh, meet in the middle or baby step, giant step. Why baby step, giant step? Baby step? 
Baby step, giant step. Now, for general discrete logarithms, for discrete logarithms over Z P star, we know better ways to do it. This is not by far not the best algorithm. <coughs> so, discrete logarithm problem over Z P star, uh, we can solve it using something called the number field SIF, which is a scary number that uh, which runs in time, the scary number that Shafi wrote on the board, which uh, well, it's something like a, a cube root log p. Something like that, okay? Then polynomial p terms. So this is better than square root p. Right? Square root p is like e to the log p over 2. This is like e to the cube root of log p. Much better, right? Exponent. So then, you know, someone asked uh, in the last class, how do you set security? How do you pick P? What is N? How, yeah, you know, uh, how large a prime should I pick? Why well, not? Try running the best algorithm on increasingly, or rather, try extrapolating the running times of the best algorithm on increasingly larger sort of input sizes. And stop when you think, you know, the algorithm won't, or its successors, conceivable successors, won't work for another 10 years. It is an art. It's not, it's not mathematics. It's, uh, uh, so this is the algorithm. It's not polynomial time. It's not purely exponential time either. It's some some way. In practice, what people use is not ZP star for the most part. It's a different class of groups that come from elliptic curves, which maybe we'll do in the rest of the in some somewhere in the class, but maybe not. But it's, a, it's another class of groups. Now, given any class of groups and a way to find generators and the group description, you can define the discrete logarithm problem. It's a very general problem. Right? Uh, it turns out the discrete logarithm problem over elliptic curve groups appropriately, carefully, and appropriately defined. The best algorithm to solve it is guess what? Uh, yes, best known algorithm runs in square root of this one. This algorithm runs in any group. You don't need to. It just uses a group operation, okay? And for elliptic curve groups of that particular form, that is the best known. And that's what people use in practice. Why do people use in practice? Because if the adversary can only do, only run an exponential, purely exponential time, that means <coughs> that hardness kicks in for relatively small n. Right? So I can set my keys to be smaller. Everything runs faster. We're all happy. Send things over the internet and so discrete logarithm. So yes. This is sort of a, a happy coincidence that these groups we know have a harder discrete logarithm problem than uh star or can you actually like design it so as to maximize the hardness of the discrete logarithm? It's very hard to argue anything of that nature, right? Because we don't know how to prove, you know, unconditional statements of the type you're saying. That discrete log takes time. Here is a group, right, with a, with a small description for which discrete log actually takes time square root of the system. We don't know how to prove these things. Elliptical groups are conjectured to have this property, the property that, uh, that you're saying. Now, do they have this property or not? I, it's very hard to say. I don't understand the curves well enough to uh, comment. But people widely believe that uh, that this is the case, and you know the security of the internet lies on this assumption that uh, you know if you set n the input sizes to be 256, the relatively small number, if you think about it, this big log remains fine. So, lots of money uh, busting on this. Uh, the, the truth of your your question. All right, so we'll continue.